Um, when WWE finally fills the role of lead booker, it's Ole Anderson. Oh, was I longing for Ric Flair back in charge? Because I was really, like I said, maybe I, I you know, Rick took out some frustration on me there, but I was just thrilled with the way I was used. And then when Ole came in, I mean, I just was not an Ole guy. You, uh, you go out of your way to acknowledge to yourself, man, it feels like my days are numbered. Mm -hmm. So I just need to go talk to Ole. And to his credit, you write in your book, Ole talked to me for a long time and did have some noteworthy points. Among them was an analogy to war atrocities. Yeah, he basically says, you know, the first time you see something in war, it's the worst thing you've ever seen. And how as more, uh, you know, casualties are taken on, it becomes a less and less of a big deal. And he likens that to the bumps that I'm taking, which is really, you know, it's a, it's a good fundamental point, especially about, you know, uh, minimizing the number of times. He wasn't saying that, but in my head, I'm thinking I need to maximize the importance minimize the number max or at least lessen it uh maximize the importance so that they stand out when i do them but you know i think you know uh, only could have seen you know he didn't see not everybody's going to see that in you right and uh i've been wrong on a number of occasions about talent that's turned out to be much bigger than i thought they would be and uh i think only was wrong in this case he would say, I understood Ole's point, but he wasn't quite through yet. You see, kid, the marquee says wrestling. That's what we're going to give them. If people wanted to see your goddamn trampoline act, they'd go buy, see, go buy a ticket Corbett. to see. What's that? Did he say Olga Corbett? Kathy Rigby. Kathy Rigby, even older than, uh, than Olga Corbett. He started to say a bunch of things that started with, back in my day. <laughs> and by the end of our talk, I could pretty much see the writing on the wall. Still, I hung around for a little while because of the money. Listen, I know that, you know, your, your dream was to be a wrestling star and somewhere along the way you decided I'd like to make a living at this and you are. Yeah. So you got to be hesitant to not just say, well, this isn't what I want. I want to walk away that, Hey, we got this security. We need to at least think through this. Uh, a few weeks later, I had talks with Kevin Sullivan, Jim Cornette and Jim Ross, and then gave only my one month's notice. He didn't exactly beg me to reconsider. Mm -hmm. Talk me through that. Oh, man. Yeah, you see the writing on the wall, and this is, you know, it's uh, to keep your head above water in a competitive atmosphere is really difficult. Yeah. It feels like some people are stepping on you to keep you down. And there's this one moment where Ole's going to come out with his crew, guys. The Gluger was the crew. I don't know if it was a reformed horseman or what it was. Basically going to come out right before one of my matches and tell me it hit the road. Just like, you know, this is not a difference between calling somebody a job guy and a, I guess it is your job guy and enhancement talent like he comes out he's gonna basically just <laughs> exile me and when he goes you know hit the road and then I say will I still get paid for today and I managed to like get a little bit of that for myself and he's like yeah, I, I just get out of here and it's like okay I'm going to leave, but in the same way, you know, if you're if you're being uh, beaten on tremendously, if somebody's not interested in giving you anything, there are ways to keep yourself alive with the facial expressions or, or whatnot. And I felt like I was, you know, desperately trying to get a gasp uh, uh, of air while I was being pushed down. And I just thought, you know, I had an idea of where I wanted to be, Conrad, and it wasn't a year later as someone who can't find work anywhere. So to take that dive, you know, to, to deep, deep dive and believe in yourself enough to give your notice and go back on the wild and unsure independent scene, it was a leap of faith. Uh, but I, I've always, I've always appreciated people who have done it since then. Cody, you know, with his oh, yeah. list of guys, the young bucks, I mean, the, the list goes on and on, but the uh, prevailing logic was take the money, take the money. And at that time, like I said, I'm making 1500 even after taxes and road expenses, I'm saving seven or 800 a week. You know, to have another $35,000 saved in 1990, like if I'd worked another year, it's a big deal. be a big deal. But I just had an idea of where I wanted to be and I couldn't, I didn't think I could get there. 
If, if you were married with young kids at the time, would you have made a different decision? My, well, I was married and had young kids when I left in 94. That's a good point. So, no, it was the same decision. I'm going to uh, take this leap of faith, and, I, you know, and I'm going to hope, I'm going to pray that it, uh, it works out. But most importantly, I'm going to work really hard and do everything in my power to ensure that it does pay off.